Hey friends, my name's Georgie and you are listening to the first 2021 episode of the Just Breathe podcast where I'll be talking all things breathing to help empower you guys to use the power of your breath to harness your bodies and minds. In today's episode, I'll be chatting to freediver turned breath coach and yoga teacher, Rebecca Coles. Rebecca is the UK's leading female pool freediver holding national records in breath hold swimming with and without fins. Freediving or breath hold diving is a method of underwater diving that does not require the help of a breathing apparatus. That's right, no snorkel, no oxygen tank, nada. <laughs> Rebecca was so generous in sharing her free diving journey, as well as how a number of different breathing modalities and yoga helped her along in her journey. If you haven't already, don't forget to like, share and subscribe to the Just Breathe podcast. Why not leave a little review while you're at it? <laughs> Let's keep on building that strong breathing community. The more people talking about breathing, the better. All right, let's dive, excuse the pun, right into the conversation. This is episode 14 of Just Breathe with Rebecca Coles. Rebecca is in the house. Hey, how you doing, Rebecca? Hi, uh, I'm good, thank you. Really good. And you? Yeah, I'm great. Thank you so much for coming on the Just Breathe podcast. Such a pleasure to have you here. You're welcome. Thank you for asking me. <laughs> no, honestly, it, it's awesome. Obviously, I met you during the amazing Kumbaka Festival. Um, do you plan on doing any more of those? It was absolutely yeah. brilliant. I did enjoy it. So mm. for those who um, maybe aren't aware of that, yeah, in yeah, November, yeah. I um, I brought together some speakers from the free diving world, from the yeah. breathwork world, and from yoga. Yeah. Because I know that they've all got such interesting stories that all intertwine, mm. and um, you know these people are just so um, happy to give their time to speak and share their stories as well. So we yeah. all came together. Um, over a weekend mm -hmm. and um, just to celebrate the joy of breathing and holding your breath. It so, was amazing. I, I actually could not believe the caliber of people that you managed to get on there when I sort of read the lineup and you know you're, you're seeing world record holding free dives on. And of course you're a record holder yourself in, in the UK for free diving which we'll get into um but you know we we had people tuning in from Egypt talking and also it was just incredible and the 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 vibe and the energy considering you know we're in the midst of quite difficult times was just so needed and so brilliant so yeah I thought that was great great I'm really glad you enjoyed it and you know yeah. I think people who are into the breath are just so willing to to share what they know because they yeah have gone through that transformation themselves. Yeah, yeah, I agree totally. Listen, I'd love to hear your story about your free diving journey, because of course that was quite a journey and you've really made some accomplishments there as, you know, the the top female in the UK. So I'd love, how did you get into free diving? So it's strange really, because I, I came into free diving quite late in terms of being an athlete so wow. I think I was around about 37 when I came in right. so I'm 44 now uh -huh. um gosh don't and I it. actually um I started as a scuba diver so I've scuba dived all my oh, life right. I really love the sea mm. um I'm an environmental scientist by training oh, and amazing. so for me to get into the water normally it was with tanks and when I moved to Bristol um mm probably about ooh, 10, 12 years ago now. Yeah. I wanted a way of meeting new people. So I joined the local scuba club. And awesome. that, they set up all these training sessions. And one of them was to go free diving in a pool. So I went along, not really knowing anything about free diving, just thinking, oh, well, this is fun. And actually, you know, I really quite enjoyed it. It was holding our breath, swimming a couple of lengths in the pool. Um, yeah. it, this was a really small pool at the time, obviously. Well, I, I was going to say, Bristol and free diving aren't two things I would instantly... Not, they weren't then, but they are now, because we've had um, a world champion come from Bristol as well. 
Bristol is the place to go if you it want to learn free diving people. So, um, so yeah, so I sort of tried out free diving and something did click with me and I thought mm -hmm. I want to do this more. But at the time we'd gone over to London to do this and there wasn't anywhere in Bristol to do free diving. Right. So with the help of the guys in London, they actually helped me set up the club in Bristol. And I'm really proud because the club now um, is generally full. I think they've got at least 30, 40 members. And that is full because you just can't fit that many divers in a pool. Of course. Right. Um, but at the time, we just, you know, three or four of us got started. Amazing. And we're just training for fun. And this carried on for a couple of years until I start. we started to mix with some of the free divers in the rest of the country. And particularly up in the north because I'm from there and mm -hmm. I travel up there quite a lot to see family and one of the guys up there um, called Steve Millard he was a coach and a, um, a trainer and he said that he saw something in me he thought that I would have the discipline to do more serious training which I right. liked that at the time obviously so I like oh. late 30s it's like I'm going to train as an athlete and compete what are you talking about but I went along with it wow. and um, lo and behold, and this was a trait of Steve's was that he always was one step ahead of me in my mind. So right. he knew I was going to succeed before I did and before I believed in it. And I think for right. me, belief was the big thing because once yeah. I could believe that, you know, I could achieve these distances underwater, holding my breath, then it was actually quite easy to go ahead and do it. Right. So just like, um, you know, usual athletic training, um, you know, we're doing some cardio work, strength work, but a lot of the work was breath work, um, dry and breath work in the pool. Yeah. So um, and it, I think it was three or four months after we started working together, I did my first competition um, and it went really well and it was really wow. positive and um, the strange thing about free diving as a sport is that you um, you know you have to show that you are completely conscious when you come up from the dive right because you you can't um, sort of come out from the dive having pushed yourself to the absolute limit and be all over the shop and yeah. as long as you know yeah, somebody I've heard about you this then, um, you know, you, that's a successful dive because that's not fair. Right. So to make it fair, the rule is that you have to come up, you have to take off your goggles or your mask, you have to give a signal and say, I am okay. And that yeah. has to be audible and seen by a judge. And it all gets videoed. So it's all um, very fair. Yeah. So, you know, you, you have to work quite hard to make sure that you are conscious when you come up from your dive. So... A lot of the training is just knowing how far you can push yourself in a breath hold, right. but still be, um, still be fine to come up. Not and push yourself when, past that limit. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that was when I learned about the bore effect, which is something that we talk a lot um, in oxygen advantage and butane. Yeah, yeah. Because diving with some carbon dioxide within the system mm. um, is one of the key factors that make sure that you've still got enough oxygen to your brain and that you're when you right can't. makes sense yeah so, uh, right. so yeah so I think a few months after we started training um, I did a couple of competitions and then got bold and went along to the world championships which oh, went fantastically wow. well <laughs> I, I mean I didn't you know incredible get um amazing results compared with others but for me it was amazing because I got to meet a lot of the top free divers yeah. and um and it, and it gave me the belief that I could do what they were doing and that yeah. was a really big thing for me and it was then when I came back that I was able to start setting records wow so at that point when you were competing how long were you holding your breath for so the swims underwater, so I competed just in the pool, so this yeah. isn't there. Um, yeah. So probably around about three minutes. Right, wow, that, that's still a substantial time to, yeah. to hold your breath for, because of course a lot of people associate the three minute breath hold now with, with the Wim Hof technique, because that sort of seems to be like the, the ultimate, that, but you're hyperventilating before you hold your breath then, and you're not doing that before you free dive, is that correct? No. Right. So not only are you taking that breath on a normal breath mm. actually 
quite a lot of free divers will breathe minimally so as to start the dive with a slightly higher carbon dioxide. So there's absolutely right. no hyperventilation at all. No. And, um, and the other thing you have to remember is those three minutes are moving all the time. Yeah, you're not, so you're not lying. Not, you know, there are disciplines yeah. where you just lie face down in the water, but these swims underwater, you're having to move continuously because you're in the pool. Three minutes. Oh, so, my goodness. Um, and, I, and I will say at the end of a three minute dive, it feels like you've run a marathon, the I amount bet. of lap in your body yeah I bet and you have to go and wash out you know swim quite a lot afterwards just to yeah. wash all of that out of your system yeah and it yeah. took me probably 24 hours to get over a swim of that length just in wow. terms of the, the physical effect on the body wow oh my goodness but I mean when you're in it what is going on mentally for you I mean I suppose and I heard this in a few interviews at the Kambaka Fest that you're wanting really as little going on mentally as possible right for it to sort yeah. of be like a, a meditation but you know is that something you work towards actually because it must be very very mental as well as physical because breathing is such a, a vulnerable thing I have found that doing any sort of, of breath hold can be especially if it's your first time quite vulnerable that, that you are stopping the breath but obviously it can be so beneficial for your health done correctly absolutely mm. and uh you know in terms of the the mental side yeah. of free diving you know you you're balancing yes you are you're trying to use the brain as little as possible because the brain uses quite a lot of oxygen right. so you know you want to save the oxygen for the organs rather than yeah. Up here. um but you but you still need to be aware of what's going on so for yeah. me in the pool I used to use the black line so it was like a meditation on the black line at the right bottom of the pool. and um I would keep all of my focus on that because the dive itself was quite uncomfortable so anybody who's held their breath for uh, a length of time so that you start to feel what we call involuntary contractions. Yeah, those diaphragmatic contractions. Yeah, yeah, stri a strong urge to breathe. Um, you know, most people, when they're holding their breath dry, will hold for maybe a few of those and then let go. And, and, yeah. and that's about it. For me, my contractions would start probably around about 30 or 40 meters into the dive. And I was diving right. 150, 180 meters. Oh, so it's, it's with you almost so for the whole most dive. Of that dive, I'm having these involuntary contractions, which Gosh. are quite uncomfortable. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. so, you know, the, the mental focus, you're trying to relax. Yeah. Um, but you're also just trying to relax into this discomfort. Mm. And that but for while, me. While swimming, right? So whilst while swimming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Something so, that actually requires. Muscle work as well yeah to and, balance. and and part of the, a lot of the training we do is to get your swimming technique to the point where it's um what we call kind of unconscious competent no, yeah 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 so yeah basically you um you don't need to think about your technique it's yeah. all done all of yeah. all through the training right so I almost didn't have to think about um the action of swimming because I've done good. so many miles of <laughs> swimming <laughs> um but for me, that ability to relax into the discomfort is what has spurred me on to, to take this into and share this with people who don't want to do free diving and don't want to even right. get their, their toes wet. Because that, for me, was the big skill that I took away. Yeah. And, you know, what I didn't mention before, actually, is when I went into free diving, I've actually suffered with anxiety for most of my life. Right. And through the process of the breath work and the free diving, it just went away. Like I couldn't tell you an exact wow. specific point in time. Yeah. But I seem to just be so much better at handling daily stresses, but also when really big, you know, life changing events happen and being able to manage the anxiety and choose what your reaction is, mm. even in the midst of discomfort and I you know yeah. I'm absolutely sure that that came from that training 100% yeah I mean it definitely sounds like a training of both yes athletic performance but of resilience of the mind that getting 
making the uncomfortable comfortable and and that that doesn't just translate into sports right like you said that translates into every other area of life which is I'm sure you agree it is why I definitely find breath work so incredibly powerful because however you do it free diving whether you even do some high altitude yoga or whatever you're doing by working with your breath there is always a journey of building resilience there and you can go into science of the vagus nerve of course but I think there is something more just that can't be explained but that is it's that journey I suppose isn't it of of facing something that you maybe never would have considered before like holding your breath for three minutes and swimming definitely that's mental (laughs) but brilliant and, you know, you, need, you don't really need anything special for this. No. So a lot of people think, you no, know, free divers need to have really big lungs. My lungs are of completely average size. Yeah. And, um, you know, one of the divers that I spoke to during the breath festival is Sarah Campbell, whose lungs yes. are around about three litres. So they're even, she's quite small. Is that average so or is that below average? It's below mean? average. I is mean, it? average for oh. a woman is four, but right. she is quite small, but yeah. her lungs are about three litres. But she set two world records, <laughs> one of, you know, which Incredible. have only recently been broken. Yeah. And so the, the lung size, you know, it, it, it can help. But yeah. It's not the determining factor. The determining factor is the mind. Really. Right. It's just so powerful, isn't it? And yeah. through the training, do you increase your lung capacity? No. I mean, you can't really, strictly speaking, you, you can't expand your lung capacity. Right. I mean, there is some science that suggests that swimming itself can, can help increase lung capacity in terms of the actual size of the lungs because you're training right. under the hydrostatic pressure mm. but really what I would say the improvement is in how well you use your breath right it might feel like your lung capacity is much bigger yeah but actually what's happened is you've just used your breath more effectively right just which, working better with what you've got yeah. so to all intents and purposes yes you've got more lung capacity because you're using right. your breath better but I think in terms of the lung size I don't think it actually can change that much right I see okay and I whilst we're on the subject of free diving I wanted to go into some of those sort of myth busters on, on how dangerous the sport really is especially in terms of competitive free diving because I recently read James Nestor's book Deep which of course we were talking about before which is absolutely brilliant and he covers so many bases of free diving used as research as well as competitive free diving but he definitely does highlight a lot of the dangers of but you know he's talking about world competitive free divers like the top of the lot Um, so in terms of someone like me if I I'd love to start trying some free diving um, how many of those dangers, you know, are, are there to really worry about? I'd love to know okay. about that. Yeah, I mean, so free diving is dangerous in the sense that you're the water, and if you're on your own and you're not trained, yeah. then really bad things can happen because you right. could black out. Often there isn't a sign that you're going to black out. Yeah. So it's not that you can just stop yourself from going too far. Actually, sometimes it and if there's not someone there who knows what to do you are in trouble right so the first message is if you want to try free diving get trained there's plenty of instructors these days yeah and always dive with somebody else who is also trained I've heard that yeah never hold your breath in the bath no (laughs) so (laughs) just try it out three minutes especially if it's doing Wim Hof <laughs> no gosh that's a people big have actually thing, died so, I guess they have yeah, doing, doing because, Wim Hof and then doing getting into water yeah which is good to mention I suppose yeah. because when you hyperventilate you switch off those the chemo receptors the alarm bell to breathe is sort Absolutely. of snoozed and muted and so you can black out without yeah any warning you know like you say that can happen in free diving as well but that is so important whenever we mention the Wim Hof method and any sort of breath holding do not do it yeah (laughs) in water in water absolutely I mean hyperventilating before you hold your breath is you basically it's like driving a car without a fuel gauge yeah 
which if you're dry, okay, what's the worst that can happen is you maybe just tumble off your seat onto the, the floor. Yeah. So that's why we always You'll say okay. you know, your breath holds on the floor as well. Yeah. Um, but yeah, definitely not in water. So that's the first thing. Yeah. The second point is that, you know, our, our bodies are very well prepared for breath holding. Yeah. It's They're almost as if we evolved to be yeah. able to hold our breath underwater. It's funny yeah. that there's some theories around us being aquatic apes, of course. Of course. Um, I mean, yeah, actually, it, it may be a good time to mention. Have you heard about um, the amazing women um, in Japan? I think it is that dive down to to get um, yes. all the the pearls. Was it? So they they dive mainly for abalone, but abalone. I, think, I think in the past it was pearl. Yeah, uh, it was pearl uh, collection uh, and, and various shellfish. They, yes. so they do it in South Korea as well. Yeah, um, I spent a year living in South Korea as an English teacher, and I actually went to go and see them. Oh wow! So they're pr in in Korea. They're primarily on an island called Jeju Island. Mm -hmm. um, they're called the Haenyo. Yes, and that's there's it. been some beautiful um, films made about this. So if you have a look. YouTube yeah they're amazing and it's it's unfortunately it's a bit of a dying art so a lot of them yeah, are quite not elderly many left, right yeah um but it's amazing what they do you know they spend all day in the water and it's cold yeah so the temperature in South Korea is is quite similar to sort of um you know kind of Atlantic water temperatures or right. kind of I think it's um on a, a similar latitude as New Zealand so it's yeah. not warm mm. um but yeah, it's amazing. And, and, you know, we've learned quite a lot about what happens when you hold your breath through, through divers, such as, uh, as those women, right. but also a lot of the research that we, you know, we now take for granted, a lot of that came through free diving. And I yeah. think that's why there is this intrinsic link between free diving and breath work, especially when there's breath holding. Yeah. Because we learned through free diving that the body has an oxygen conserving response. Yeah. So it's called the mammalian dive reflex. Mm -hmm. And so when you hold your breath and especially if you have some immersion of the face in the water and the, and the body, your body goes into a mode which will conserve oxygen by drawing the blood in towards the core, your heart rate goes down mm. and you know, this is what is protecting the body from any potential impact from holding your breath. Yeah. Now, that's why, you know, we quite often are questioned by people in the medical um, industry who see unhealthy patients come in with blood oxygen saturation below 95 right. or down to sort of 90. And they're horrified because that's, you know, for an unhealthy person to have blood oxygen that low you know like they're seeing in covid now yeah they're really worried about that right but through you know what we call intermittent hypoxia training mm -hmm. because we're holding the breath the body kicks into this response and actually it's safe to hold your breath like that even if you're dropping your blood oxygen because it's just for short periods of time momentarily yeah um so this is what happens when we dive mm -hmm. and to drop down to depth, which is what um, James Nestor was talking about, we have this added danger, which is that the pressure of the water can squeeze the lungs to the point where, if you're not careful, it can damage the lung tissue right. and it can damage the alveoli. Mm -hmm. So there is an adaptation that happens if you dive a little bit deeper each time. So if yeah. you're careful about how deep you're diving and you're on a, you know, you're, you're taking your time to get to the deep. Yeah. Then your body's going to adapt and you're not going to come up against these issues with the lungs. Yeah. Where the big danger lies. And unfortunately we have seen this happen more and more recently is where people push themselves too quickly. Yeah, that, that's what I was yeah. just, I mean, is it about your intention going into free diving that are you doing it for yourself or are you doing it to prove, you know, that you can beat someone else? Because it should always be for yourself, right? And for your own body and uh, your own mind and, you know, that, that you should only really be competing against yourself as such because you're working with the breath. 
Yeah, I mean, most most free divers are competing against themselves. The way yeah. that the competition is set up is, yeah, of course, you know, there are rankings and medals, etc., right, etc. Right, right. But you know, most free divers will be doing it for themselves. Yeah. But the ego is a really difficult thing to deal with, and yeah. even if you go into it with the right intention, just that temptation to go a bit deeper. To further. be diving and thinking, oh, this feels okay. Yeah. You know, even though I, I said I'd only go to this depth, maybe I'll just go a bit deeper. Right. And, um, or, you know, you've set your intention at a competitive, um, you know, they set the line so you can't actually go any deeper. But as you yeah. go down through the dive, something doesn't feel quite right. A well trained diver will just turn, go back up to the surface and just do it another day. Yeah. But unfortunately, what happens is that competitive urge can just trip the brain into thinking, oh, I'll just push through it. Yeah. Now, anyone who works with athletes know that athletes train to push through discomfort and pain. Of course we do. Yeah. But you can't do that in free diving. <laughs> Not at depth anyway, no. because it's just too dangerous um, yeah. for the lungs. The lung tissue is really is really dangerous. So I think that is the key thing, really. Yeah. I think free diving is really safe as long as you're trained and you take it steady. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, a great message for life, actually. <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. A hundred percent. Now, this mammalian dive reflex, is that the feeling that free divers describe when they, they talk about this blissful meditative state that that a lot of free divers say they enter when doing these long breath holds but in the water there, there's a lot of talk isn't there of breath holding in and out of the water and that when you do get in that flow of sort of that that glide if you're going at depth or I suppose even in a pool um that you do go into this different sort of of, of state and is that about the human connection to water or I don't know what's your experience of that I think some of it is, I mean, obviously the, the, the dive reflex is going to help your heart rate drop. Yeah. So the divers who are holding their breath for a long time or going very deep, their heart rate slows right down. Right. To the point where they can almost feel it. And it's, you know, it's right, right down, maybe wow. 20 beats or even less, really, really low. Gosh, yeah. Um, and, you know, I think just like any meditative state, they you know they've trained they've trained themselves to that kind of level of brain waves I think it's is yeah. it gamma I think it's gamma I brain waves so. that tend to be um the prevalent ones during meditation right. I think you sort of do get into that kind of state um I mean I think the connection with water is one that really really helps because there's this sense of being effortless under the water yeah and, um, you know, you are supported so you can either float, you can drop and sink through the water. Yeah. Um, and this little bit of hydrostatic pressure that you have and which increases as you go down almost feels like a little bit of a hug. Yeah, it's holding you. So, wow. yeah. So there's a sense there of, of support, um, which really, really does help when you're holding your breath, because like you said earlier, there is this there's a vulnerability there. Right. You know, you're going to this sort of primeval fear yeah. of not being able to breathe. And if you've got something that is just around you, supporting you, that really, really helps. And mm. I think that's the difference between holding your breath in the water and holding your breath in air. Yeah, right. I mean, the word effortless is a brilliant one. It's something I use myself when teaching breathing a lot because I really believe that is the key to optimal breathing is, is effortless breathing. And of course is a huge message message as well of the oxygen advantage. And I'm curious, where did the oxygen advantage, and I know you do a lot of soma breath work as well. Where did that all come in, in, in your journey, all these other mo modalities of breathing? Yeah, it's really interesting. So I stopped free diving in about the end of 2015, right. um, start a family. So I've, yeah. I've got a young boy now. And oh. um, when he was, it was probably about two years ago now, I'd, I, I had in the back of my mind uh, a paper, a scientific paper that was written back in, I think it was 2010, right. by a French researcher, um, exercise scientist um, called um, 
Frédéric Lemaitre. Hopefully I haven't um, <laughs> butchered his name too much. <laughs> but he sure. wrote a paper called, Is Apnea a New Training Method in Sport? Right. Now I'd had that paper in the back of my mind for ages. And when I was sort of coming back to, okay, I'd finished my maternity leave. I was thinking, okay, what, well, you know, I, I have a, a job. I work as an environmental scientist, but I wanted something more. I wanted something that was mine. And yeah. I had been teaching yoga and I wanted to, you know, bring my yoga teaching back. But I thought there's something in what I've learned from the free diving mm. that can be applied to sport. And I've always been a keen runner. So I used to run as part of my training as well. And I thought, you know, I'm absolutely convinced that there's a benefit from the breath work for runners. Yeah. And that paper was one thing that made me think. And I was scrolling one day and I came across the Oxygen Advantage book. And I was like, yeah. oh my goodness, I read it. And I was like, oh, somebody's had the same idea. Yes. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. And I hadn't come across that before. Um, However, I had been, uh, I had trained myself to nose breathe during running already. Right. Off the back of another book. So I think it was probably 2012, 2013, I was yeah. already nose breath running. Good, um, yeah. And so when I read Oxygen Advantage, it all just fell into place. Right. And I knew right then that I wanted to teach this. Yeah. So that was the first, um, you know, I became an Oxygen Advantage instructor. Mm -hmm. And that is always the place where I will start with people. Yeah, because you can't introduce any other form of breath work until their breathing is a, a reasonably functional in a reasonably functional place. Well, 100 percent, because so many people do think of breath work, don't they, as in a yoga studio for an hour that, that they'll breathe in this incredible way and have an amazing experience for an hour. But then they snap out of it and they go back into their lives and they're back to habitual breathing, which maybe seven eight out of ten times is dysfunctional and possibly yeah. through the mouth short and shallow could be better and could you know optimize their health a little bit more so I, I think that's an amazing thing to mention that until you get that habitual breathing to an optimal place you're never going to get the most out of all those fancy modalities of breath work which can provide amazing experiences but you know, why not start with that foundational? Absolutely. Foundation I think you breathing. have to start there. Yeah. And actually, you know, you mentioned yoga. Yeah. There's a big problem in yoga classes these days where, you know, I trained as a yoga teacher 12 years ago. Right. And I was only taught the biomechanics of breathing. So just the expansion of the di of the uh, lower ribs, sorry, breathing, the, the dropping basically. of the diaphragm, yeah. And some classical pranayamas, which is what we call the, the breath works. Um, mm. And most yoga teachers, I think, are still trained at around about that level for at least their basic training. Right. And so you go to a yoga class, they teach you belly breathing, which is gen it's basically over breathing. Yeah, they a big breath, right? In through the nose, off and out through the mouth. And they're like, take a big yeah big breath which actually potentially and they say you're super oxygenating yourself right and it's not really <laughs> no but it's of course it's not the yoga teacher's fault um no it's their training but it does bring about a question that you know 2020 coming into 2021 could we be doing better now yeah. there's so much research out there about the the correct way to breathe yeah. So I, I think James Nestor's book has done a lot to bring this into the mainstream. Yeah, um, I agree. You know, those who have come across Patrick's book as well, of course. Mm. Um, and, you know, one of the things I, so I like to work with runners in particular. Yeah. Um, and, uh, but I also now have sort of a program that is for yoga teachers to help share the oh, biochemistry. And so that they can have the confidence to, teach functional breathing but also teach breath holding as part of their um their yoga classes because yeah. uh, holding your breath which is why i called the festival pumbaka mm -hmm. because that is the yoga term for holding your breath and it's really mm -hmm. at the heart of all of yoga and in the western world yoga has become synonymous with postures yeah which is only really a very is only you know, if you look at the eight limbs of yoga, mm. so the postures are one eighth of what yoga is. A fraction. A fraction. And, you know, d 
doing breath work and holding your breath is really the only way that you go down the path of um, into meditation and to reach yeah. this kind of higher benefits of yoga. Mm. But they're so they're not taught very much, and that's a real shame. Yeah. Do Do you think now the focus is more about doing a handstand with as many necklaces as you can find on Instagram? <laughs> For some, there, there is there is a there's been a turning point, so that yeah. there's definitely a shift. Right, it's People happening. People are starting to move away from the Instagram postural yoga. Yeah, but you know, in terms of the teachers, I think the public is taking a while to catch up because right, you speak to the average person on the street and you say yoga, they basically think it's stretching and it's holding postures. Downward dog child yeah. pose warrior two right yeah and it's not to say that people aren't going to get huge benefits from doing that and feel really Moving relaxed the and, body right yeah it's you know it's absolutely fantastic but if teachers can understand the biochemistry and maybe stop people over breathing in class and they're not going to take that away and think that it's okay to do that in the rest of their life as well yeah and it's also i think conveying a beautiful message of less is more of that you don't need to be in a full split or you know definitely turn yourself into a human pretzel to to do yoga that actually like you said that it is a fraction of the practice and that actually and I think this was mentioned in Kumbhaka festival that all of yoga you know the practice that's been around for 2000 years maybe more started with breathing not with the postures that it is about the prana the breath the energy and i think for me anyway the pandemic has really taught me the concept of less is more and that uh, you know th that's how breath work has, has changed my life as such in taking on that concept effortless breathing being kinder to my body kinder to myself mentally etc and the same like with your free diving like you said taking it at a pace that suits you and coming back to yoga I think that could really benefit a lot of people in taking that pressure off themselves that it's not about the posture but it's actually about feeding something a little bit deeper yes absolutely and I you know what's really interesting now is the boom in breath work Mm. um I, I you know I heard someone say breath work is the new yoga which can kind of cringe worthy a little <laughs> bit but I think there's an element of truth in that yeah 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 you know I'm this for the next two months I've signed up for three different breath festivals um uh, that are online you know there's yeah the, yeah I've seen them they're brilliant so many teachers now out there doing yeah huge range of different um breath works and you know, I think to a certain extent, you mentioned Wim Hof earlier, I think um, his input into the breathwork world has certainly helped because he's yeah. one of the, the most well-known. Yeah, I think he's said um, an amazing thing. Yeah, and, you know, I think it's fantastic that there are so many different modalities out there. What concerns me is, is what we talked about earlier was people going into some of the bigger breathing type modalities skipping um needing to have an effective breath and yeah. even in yoga the the main prerequisite is that you can breathe effectively before you move into doing breath work right. but unfortunately that gets skipped and you have people doing practices like Wim Hof doing practices like holotropic breathing which is yeah. you know doing continuous breaths for a couple of hours where you basically uh, get into a state of quite extreme hyperventilation mm. and um, putting the body under quite extreme stress as well. Yeah. Right. And, I, and I think the more I think about it, the more I, I'm a little bit concerned that there's a lot of these breath works uh, can get you high. You get a feeling of, of feeling quite high. And yeah. it worries me that people just are going to, do more and more of this because there's an attachment to the feeling high yeah and you're going to lose the perspective on well actually what are the benefits of this and the the day-to-day -day, you know 24 7 breathing which is actually far more important than a temporary feeling of bliss which is lovely yeah but it's not 
it's not why we do it it's so much more than that right mm. and it is the twenty five thousand plus breaths per day you're taking that that really really counts um i completely agree uh, with that that I, I think what wim hof has done is incredible and especially with bringing a lot more of the male population into breath work and we Definitely. talked about before we you know started recording um about that breathing and breath work definitely used to be associated with yummy mummies in a yoga studio or meditating together and, and you know you're chanting or pretending to be clouds or something whereas <laughs> now this sort of danger element of, of the cold exposure and the ice baths have sort of made made it a lot more appealing uh, to the male population it seems to be quite even now I mean the free diving world seems to be quite even it is in yeah. general which is really yeah. cool yeah yeah I, I think that's awesome um but I agree that that grounded simpler practice again that less is more is so important which I think is a lesson the western world needs to learn is that mm. it's not more 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 is more it's less is more that actually the simpler you can make it and I heard this from Dan Brule that he said in all his years of practicing his task was to make everything he's learned as simple and basic as physically possible because it's then translatable and that's actually when when you have the most profound experiences with the most simple practice i i, I agree and you, you i want to get on to soma because you do practice soma do you teach soma as well yeah so yeah. teaching soma um has been much more recent so i just trained right. as an instructor i think it was during the lockdown actually oh really now, recent. so the soma method is is quite similar to wim hof mm. um there's rhythmic breathing to music which um the creators of soma um uh niraj in particular um he spent quite a lot of time before he moved into breathwork creating music. So he's created oh, a lot awesome. of really great music um, that you can breathe to. Yeah. And I think that's really helpful for keeping people to a rhythm. Yeah. A lot of the benefits actually come from the breath being rhythmic. Yeah. Because if your breath is quite erratic, mm. then that's not going to help the heart rate and blood pressure. Right. Um, and, and, and sort of trying to get into this state of what we call um, heart coherence or, you know, synchrony yeah. between the pressure, heart rate, breathing yeah, rate. Yeah. So there's this lovely uh, rhythmic breathing to music. And then you hold your breath on the full exhale. So that's why it's quite similar to Wim Hof. But the breathe up, as we call it, is, is quite gentle. Yeah, it's in and out so through the nose, right? Uh, well, it, it can be whatever you want it to be. So I right. teach in through the nose and then either out through the nose or through the mouth in right. a really gentle way. Yeah. Um, but from what I understand, I think the Wim Hof breathing is a bit stronger. Yeah. Um, but, you know, there's nothing wrong with that per se. No. But the resulting breath hold you get will obviously be much easier the more you hyperventilate before. Right. Now, one of the reasons I like Soma uh, as a tool in the toolkit mm -hmm. is because being able to go into a really deep breath hold, a real point of stillness is a fantastic experience for really kind of understanding yourself. Yeah. And to do that when you don't have to deal with the discomfort of the contractions mm. is a good experience. I don't do it all the time. Obviously, yeah. as a free diver, we would only hold our breath and uh, having done no hyperventilation at all. Yeah. But it's hard and it trains mm -hmm. mental toughness. Yeah, training that resilience really, again. Yeah, but it's really hard to get into a state of quiet and stillness. So it's just another tool. Yeah. Um, so I like doing Soma um, and, and, you know, the, these kind of slightly bigger breaths and yeah. then holding my breath out because I can get a couple of minutes of just stillness and it's, it's lovely, it's beautiful. Yeah. So it's just another tool that I use, um, but I don't tend to bring it into people's um, work until I know that their breath can handle it. Right, yeah, and I, again, bringing back that point that if you are gonna do any of these Soma or even Wim Hof, that it is so much better to go through someone who is trained similar to free diving. So, that you can get the whole essence of all yeah. these 
modalities. I, I spoke to a Wim Hof instructor, brilliant woman called Hannah, and she was saying how with the Chinese whispers of Wim Hof that sort of become so famous, some people are actually missing out chunks of the method where they're sort of doing a bit of breathing and then jumping into some cold water and sort of forgetting a lot of key components that actually create the essence of the practice and absolutely um so i agree i, I think that's important yeah it's it's the youtube generation you know I, you can you can learn you can follow somebody doing wim hof on youtube but unfortunately i also saw a video of somebody who had a seizure doing that so yeah <laughs> yeah yeah well interestingly <laughs> interestingly what hannah said is that um a, a qualified wim hof instructor is actually not allowed to put any content on youtube so do not That's interesting yeah okay. do not follow um, uh anyone who isn't wim hof on youtube i think yeah. was, was the advice there um with soma um when in the kumbaka fest i did the soma session and i loved the dance elements yes. at the beginning <laughs> is was that that particular instructor or is that a part of the soma method the uh dancing it is so the, we awesome. I mean, the, yeah so you, we call it an energized meditation yeah so you you move to begin with and it can be up to the instructor I mean, we, when we're taught we're taught a particular sequence but we're then yeah. told you know you, you do what works for you sometimes I do yoga sometimes mm. I do much slower movement but actually dancing to quite ecstatic funky music yeah anybody who's been to a nightclub knows that you feel fantastic yeah, and yeah especially yeah. at the moment like we I did my I do a monthly soma class and we had this sort of ecstatic music at the end of the yeah, session yeah, yeah. and I was just like you know imagine it's new year's eve in the nightclub just go for it and you know yeah. dance as if nobody's watching because right. you're in your living room and that's what's yeah. lovely at the moment is being able to do this but you know dancing together in a room when you're doing this all together also has just this amazing uplifting uh, feeling of community and and of spirit so yes it's very much part of of the session but you know soma also has a 21 day journey mm. which you can do online and um it not only features those sort of energetic sessions but also has some it sort of builds up your practice to they have a ceremony at the end, which is quite a strong um, breathing and, and, and breath holding practice. Wow, amazing. And, and that movement always comes before the breath work, right, with Soma? Generally. Right. Um, does it, like does say, it matter? Well, I think you just have to be a little bit careful about giving people a bit of time after their breath hold before they jump up and start. Yeah, whoop, whoop. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know in the Kumbhaka we did it before and actually I yeah. found it a brilliant way to loosen the body. I mean, I love to dance anyway. I, I've been to a lot of the ecstatic dance events, which is, you know, where you're just all in a field together and just like you said, dancing like no one's watching. And it is euphoric. Yeah. Um, but also to do it in my living room, you know, it really loosened my body up, got some heat building, loosened everything up. And actually, I think I was able to enter a deeper state of relaxation that you were talking about, that space, that stillness in the breath hold. Yes. Um, so yeah. I think it does have quite a cool effect. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, normally it is right at the beginning and mm. some instructors will also do some... Um, uh, fitness moves with breath holding so right. you know like some squats or press-ups yeah similar to um, oxygen advantage there yeah and I think in. Wim Hof has something like um I'm, I'm not quite so keen on that to be honest yeah. just because you know I, I think and this is something we, we you know we it's probably going down a bit of a rabbit hole but you do need to be a little bit careful about what you do with your body yeah. while you're holding your breath yeah um, because of blood pressure effects mm -hmm. and I know you said that Simon Borg Olivier was coming on to your he podcast. is he is yes that's to, so he's you know he's very knowledgeable he's a, he's a physiotherapist mm -hmm. but also a breath holder and, and yogi yeah and you know you, you just have to be a little bit careful about limiting your movement when you are holding your breath just because it potentially can you know if somebody's blood pressure isn't at a normal rate there could be some consequences so yeah. I personally don't tend to do that but you know it is part of of, of some of the um 
of the of the sessions yeah it, it's that it's something i've been experimenting with myself and, and doing simon's masterclasses actually in terms of joint synergy and finding that sense of moving but in a relaxed state not moving through tension and yeah. actually this rounds off quite beautifully with free diving with all of the yoga and breath work we've been talking about is that actually, even in terms of fitness, and I wonder if you'd agree in terms of running, um, I've been working with an amazing coach, you, you might know him called Grey Cause with the Oxygen Advantage, mm, yes. yeah, with chi, chi running. Um, and even in something like running, which is you know quite intense in the movement in terms of, you know, on solid ground, you're, you know, you're not in water, you are putting your own body weight on the floor, but still achieving that relaxed sort of effortless state even while while running and I, I actually it's transformed my fitness um yeah. I wonder what your opinion is on that yeah I mean I I haven't I've looked into chi running a little bit mm. um I'm a big fan of nose breathing while running of course yeah. that's something that um I train myself to do I'm also a fan of the low heart rate training so actually that, you know, at least 80% of your running should be easy and it yeah. should be at quite a low heart rate. And of course, you need to push yourself to build strength and um, build for those, you know, competitive events where you do need to push yourself. But that should just be a small portion of what you do. Now, unfortunately, most runners go out too fast and yeah. they train too hard all of the time. Yeah. Um, and I blame Strava. <laughs> yeah. No, I don't. They've been, doing it. They've been doing it since before that came on. Mm. I think Strava brings this competitive element to every run because people go out and they want to set a new personal record. Yeah. And actually, they need to be thinking about what's their intention for training. Yeah. And 80% of the time, that should be super easy. And, you know, some of the best runners in the world, if you look at Gillian Journey, the mm -hmm. ultra marathon runner, you know, he does all of his easy runs, nose breathing. Yeah. And, you know, if you looked at um, Kipchoge's two sub two hour marathon, mm -hmm. most of the time he looks so relaxed while he's running. Yeah. Yeah. But I wonder and as well. See him breathing. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Effortless. I wonder as well if you know, a, a large percent of the population, because I really do believe that, that breathing will just become more and more mainstream as it should, because I truly believe it is the foundation of all health, um, that, that if more people with programs like yours with running could create running as a more meditative activity, actually a more relaxed, where you don't think of running as like, oh God, I've got to go for a run. It's actually something that's really enjoyable. Yeah. I think so much more of the population would be running um, rather than huffing and puffing like a steam train. So I agree. Relaxing yeah. into it. Yeah. I, I think a lot of people are put off running because they go out um, and they're not particularly fit to begin with and they really struggle yeah and, um and because they see all of the runners out there with their mouth open yeah they're getting out of breath quite quickly some people even wheezing etc cetera, etc cetera, and they just think well running's not for me and I think yeah. that's a really big shame because actually as humans we are designed to be able to run yeah um you know if we are healthy and and and, and sort of able-bodied then there should be no reason why we can't run but, you know, if some people have quite sensitive lungs that don't like cold air coming in, yeah. they're going to start to get tight chest and wheezing, et cetera, et cetera. And it, you know, I think it's such a shame that they then go to the doctors and get given asthma medication when actually, yeah. you know, yeah, it could be avoided. they close their mouth. And I, you know, I did a course called Just Shut Your Mouth and Run. Oh, <laughs> and I love that. That. It's like, that is what I want to sh I shout from the rooftops. Just yeah, yeah, your yeah. Mouth and run. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I've seen people out running. I've been so tempted just to tap them on the shoulder and go, just close your mouth. But of course you couldn't do that. You know, people would think I was mental. But actually, it's like I could be saving you so much hardship by just closing your mouth. But, you know, you, you've got to hope that it will make it into the, the mainstream. And it is. But obviously it, it's a drip feed. It's it's not yes. a tidal wave. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. 
how can people find you, Rebecca, if they want to work with you? Um, you know, you have so much to offer in terms of coaching and running and breath work and there's so many different things so where's the best place that people can find you yeah so um my website is called sport restore yoga yeah. um, so it's sport restore yoga.co.uk great we'll get and a link to I'm, that in the show notes yeah and yeah. i'm on instagram and facebook and um, both of those my um tag is sport rest yoga yeah um, just because i couldn't fit it all into one um <laughs> So those are kind of, uh, yeah, my uh, social media links. I, I'm going to start a podcast soon <gasps> That's in the so next exciting. few weeks. Um, I haven't quite, I've got a working title of um, Rebel Runners because nice. I want it to be fully stories of ordinary folk, mm. runners who have taken an unconventional approach to their training so they're nose Love breathing, yeah. barefoot or minimal footwear runners, yeah. low heart rate, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, yeah, so that's going to be coming soon, which that's exciting. should be really inspiring. That's what I want it to do. Yeah. I want it to inspire people who are perhaps sitting on the fence with this mm. into giving it a try. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll definitely be tuning into that. It sounds brilliant. Mm. You know, my it's definitely on my list for 2021 to um, get either a half marathon or a full one under my belt. I just love to have something to work towards. So I'll definitely be tuning yeah. in um, for that advice. And if you've been interested in the, the link with free diving, mm. I'm doing a session on the 18th of January yeah. um, on Zoom which is going to be, it's part of a 21 day breath challenge, but people can come in and just do this um, for a charity donation. Mm. if They don't want to take part in the, the full, um, the full challenge. Yeah. And it's going to be taking you on a virtual free dive. Wow. Through kind of using the Soma music, the rhythmic breathing, but yeah. really immersing you through visualization into the experience of having a dive. So awesome. if that's something that interests the listeners, then I'll give you the link so that you can it, share it, it in the show 100% notes. interests me. Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it'll interest plenty of people listening. Um, brilliant. Well, Rebecca, it's been such a joy to have you on. Honestly, I feel like we have covered sort of 10% of what we could Absolutely. talk about. Um, so keep going on for I know, hours. I know. I'll have to get you back on to talk about some other stuff when your podcast is out to see how that's all going. Um, but for now, thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure. Um, really, thank you. You're welcome and real pleasure to speak to you as well. Thank you, Georgie. Thank you.